Good afternoon, everybody. Hi, uh, how's everybody doing? I'm here today to uh, talk a little bit about coping skills and how they relate to addiction issues. Um, one of the reasons, I just a little background on myself. My name is Michael Schaefer. I've been a resident of Northeast Ohio my whole life. I currently reside in Menor. And I'm here because I'd like to discuss possibilities, ways to cope with life stressors without self-medication. I myself experimented, if you will, with drugs. I started my experimentation when I was 12 uh, with a little bit of alcohol out of my parents' cabinet. And they didn't even drink. They just had alcohol around for the holidays and stuff. So this experimentation lasted 34 years. And I failed miserably at it. <laughs> it, uh, you know, I, I had tried cigarettes thanks to my older sister when I was 12. <laughs> that was actually the last addiction that I ever kicked, and that was in 2007. But, you know, it's, it's getting ridiculous what's going on these days, especially with the opiate overdoses. I mean, we were just talking back there that Ohio's now, I think, number one in the country as far as accidental deaths and it's it's just getting to be an everyday thing that you just see every day you just see more and more articles about someone who's lost a loved one or someone who's overdosing i was just telling denise that i personally know of three f people that lost uh, a daughter or son to accidental overdose and the the first one was almost seven years ago, and the most recent one was early Thanksgiving morning. And I believe they were all in an age of like 22 to 31. So, you know, as a little background to my usage, I did the typical, you know, experimental things. Oh, I tried to cigarettes, tried a little um, alcohol. Someone introduced me to pot, so I smoked a little weed. Didn't, you know, I never thought anything of it. You just, you know, it's kind of, what you do or what I did, um, you know, there's many reasons why people start an experiment. You know, kind of you want to fit in, you know, maybe you want to impress somebody. You know, you just, kids experiment with things. I didn't know that because of my family history, I had a couple grandfathers that were both alcoholics, and that I started at such an early age that I was probably eight to 10 times more likely to become addicted and abuse substances. Um, when you start in your teens, as your brain's developing, it, it really increases your odds of abusing substances. So, you know, I was raised in South Euclid, went to high school, as I was in high school, my, my alcohol use and marijuana use got, got more intense, more regular. And eventually, I actually went to Kent State to play baseball, which I never got to do because my, I never made grades because I just started drinking more and partying more. And um, after Kent State, after about two and a half years, I ended up dropping out without ever playing a game of baseball. Um, the only saving grace is that I met my future wife at Kent State and we just celebrated our 20th anniversary last year. So it was worth it. <laughs> But, you know, um, I got involved more and more with working with addiction issues when I actually quit smoking in 2007. Because when I quit smoking, I started running. And running is something I continue to do today. Um, some people say it's an obsession. Some people tell me it's my new addiction. Whatever it is, it's positive, though. I don't miss engagements, I don't miss work, I'm not doing things I shouldn't be doing or where I shouldn't be because of running. But when I decided to take up running, I got involved with a group called Run Well after, oh, a couple years, about 2012. And uh, Run Well was founded by a lady who had a family member with an addiction, and it was founded after the frustration that she had trying to find adequate treatment which is still there today. 
But when I got involved with Runwell, I said, you know, it's time to kind of come out of the closet, if you will. And I, and I remember uh, after one of my races, I was talking to a gentleman, and we were saying something, and I said, oh, you should have seen me when I was on crack. And he just sort of laughed. He's like, aha, that's funny. I was going to tell him the story, but then he got pulled away. And then I came out like a week later on Facebook, on social media, and he saw the story, and he messaged me, and he goes, I literally thought you were just kidding. He goes, you don't seem like the type of person. And I think that's one of the reasons I'm here and decided to do what I do, because there is no type of person. Everybody assumes that addicts, people that abuse substances, are a certain type of person. Well, guess what? It's anybody. It's everywhere, and it's obviously, with, like I said, with what's going on in the news, it's prevalent. It crosses all social, economical, racial boundaries. So I, th I felt it would be good for me to just share my story with people, let them know that, you know, just because someone abuses substances, they have a problem. You know, we're not bad people. And I think that that stigma is one of the things that also got me going was that I'd hear like people that knew I had an issue and that like maybe old schoolmates go, oh, I'm just so glad I have good kids. And it's not a good or bad thing. So, and that's the whole point is that people need to understand that addiction is, is an addiction. It's, it is a disease. Now there's a lot of debate and we'll get into that in a minute you know about well it's a disease it isn't a disease but you know the whole the whole purpose is just that we as a society have to try to deal with this and if you have a loved one or family member or friend or coworker that has issues you can try to help them you can try to help yourself deal with other people's issues because that's basically all you could do no one could help me no one could make me stop but me and, you know, my parents sort of knew what was going on as I got older, but they were pretty much helpless until I wanted to stop. And uh, like I said, it's been 30, 23 years now that I, have, that I haven't stopped, or that I stopped. And uh, I got involved after Runwell. I actually left my job in 2013, a full-time job, and, and Runwell hired me as a part-time paid consultant. And as I started doing this, I ended up uh, taking classes at Lakeland here. And um, it's funny because I was talking to my wife. I realized I've taken at least one course here at Lakeland in each of the last four decades, which really makes me old. It's just like amazing. But I got a health and wellness certification through Lakeland. I recently um, was certified as a running coach to help people that are getting into running. And I also received uh, through the Adams Board um, certification through the state as a peer supervisor in recovery. And what that is is more and more experts are starting to realize that people with a lived experience can really be beneficial to those that are having issues. What better person than someone who's gone through it? Now, we, you know, we, it, of course, if you've gone through one way to recovery, that doesn't mean that that would be someone else's way. So you have to be open. But as someone who's gone through it, I think I can empathize a little bit more with people who have done it. Um, you know, try to be less judgmental because that seems to be the big thing is, is everybody's pretty much judging everyone these days for what they do. And uh, so yeah, I wanted to talk about today a little more about dealing with, as you can tell, coping with life on its own terms. And uh, that's what we need to do a little bit more of. I mean, things are gonna happen. Uh, these, uh, to me, this is probably the most important aspect is your own personal attitude, how you feel about yourself, what you can do. I mean, it's, it's right there. Whether you think you can or can't, you're right. And uh, the other one is, um, it's, it's been credited to John Lennon and also someone else, uh, an author in a Reader's Digest uh, article in 1957, but those are the things that affect us most. It's not when we plan things and the plans work out. It's what happens in between those plans. And that's where real life takes place. I'm just bringing these few things up before I get more into the subject. But 
You know, there's a lot of dual diagnosis these days. It's not uncommon at all that um, you have an addiction issue and a mental health issue. And actually, um, it happens a lot in the developmental stages. And uh, when it does begin in your teen years, as your brain is developing, that's when you're most susceptible to possibly becoming an addict or abusing substances. You know, like I said before, you know, at those in the young, in your teen years, you know, you're just experimenting. You, know, you want to be cool. You want to fit in with the crowd. So you just kind of try things out, and your brain goes through these changes, and and you actually get, it actually hijacks your brain. I think. Um, these are some criteria. Just that if I got these online, it's from the uh, APA, I believe, the American Psychiatric Association. Questions to ask yourself if you are maybe drinking or misusing substances or alcohol. And, um, you know, I mean, a lot of these are common. You know, if you're, you know, larger amounts, longer than 10, someone has a party, so you do a little binge drinking. You know, but when binge drinking starts happening more often and more often, you know, then, it, then it's not binge drinking anymore. Um, you know, you want to cut down, you want to stop, but you can't, or you don't. You know, spending a lot of time to get use or recover from use. I mean, when I was in the midst of my cocaine addiction, if I wasn't using, I was only thinking of using or when I could use again. And I was functioning the whole time. I managed to work, but functioning not at the best level, but I managed to work. And I think a lot of that was just because I needed money to get drugs. And when I started using more drugs and couldn't, didn't make enough money, I started selling it because I think that was good logic. Well, I'm not spending money, so there you go. That's one of the symptoms. But, you know, inability to manage commitments due to use. I mean, I remember telling my parents what, to not come over unannounced. Even though I didn't live that far from them, it's like I didn't want that, you know, because I didn't know what state I'd be in. You know, and the thing about it is, is you don't think about it that way. You're not even, your brain is so hijacked, you're not even thinking about that this isn't normal. I mean, a lot of the thing that I did was, the most of was probably giving up important activities because of use. And a lot of that has to do with brain chemistry, endorphin release, stuff like that. As you, you know, like with me doing cocaine, I was getting like eight to 10 times the normal natural endorphin rush, if you will. And then what happens is your brain s slows down and doesn't even produce as many endorphins. So now you don't get the pleasure out of the things that used to give you pleasure. So you just say, eh, you sort of let go of them. But yeah, there's, I'm not gonna go over all of them, but you know, it's just good things to look at, ask yourself, be honest with yourself. And this is, one of the things I like to talk about is on the flyer that Denise made up for me, if you look, I believe it says 10%. One in 10 Americans over the age of 12 is addicted to drugs or alcohol, and only 11% seek treatment. And a lot of that has to do with attitude, stigma. I mean, this person I left was an American author who actually surprise, surprise, had a history of drug use and mental health issues. But with an attitude like that, who wants to seek help? You know, and and I, I say it's not my concern because I'm dealing with it, I wanna deal with it on a more personal level. I wanna, I wanna reach to the person and talk to the person t as to why they have addiction issues and what we can do to change those, whether it's a disease, whether it isn't a d disease, but I do believe it's a brain disease. And I like this lady, actually, this Sandy Swenson, unfortunately, she lost her son to addiction. And, and I sort of like this attitude that it doesn't excuse your responsibility. And, and I think that's what gets lost sometimes. I think people that don't believe it's a disease, when you say it's a disease, they're thinking, oh, that's just, sorry. That's just an excuse, and it is an excuse. There is no, you know, just like, any, like it says, any other disease, you come up with a, a plan. 
It, you know, it's not a free pass just because you have a disease. You know, if you have, a, have heart issues, you know, you, you watch your diet, you try to exercise, you know, avoid stressful situations. So these are, you know, just common sense. Now this is what really got me. These quotes are from a Cleveland.com article that was this summer and it was dealing with the heroin overdoses. And I still feel that the stigma and this public shaming that goes on in the media does one of the most great disservices when it comes to seeking treatment. I mean, open up the stadium, give them free heroin, and then let nature take its course, then dump them in the lake. I mean, as when I was abusing substances, I had low enough self-esteem and was just felt ashamed of what I was doing that knowing that there's people that have attitudes like this, why would I even consider seeking help? As I got older, I mean, and I was talking, I was not quite 30 when I finally stopped doing everything, and I'm 55 now, and honestly, I just don't care what people think because I'm just here to help people. And I understand that as you're older, it's easier to not be as influenced by people's attitudes. I knew when I came out and people heard my story that there was gonna be some relatives, you know, whispering like, I always knew there was something about him. You know, and the same ones that did, I didn't wanna say, well, you know, I used to get high with your kid, but those her kids never did anything, but we won't go there. But, so this is, like I said, my focus is on reducing the demand. And I was really pleased when I was going over, um, doing some research for a presentation I did in October that I found this actually on the DEA, DEA's website. You know, like they say, their pr primary mission and responsibility is law enforcement is to enforce the federal drug laws. But they've taken a more progressive step in that they realize you have to reduce the demand. And, and when, when I speak of reducing the demand, it's the reasons why. You know, why do I need to do drugs? Why am I um, addicted? And, you know, it starts on a personal level and it, it goes into the community. There's so many community programs out there that are available if people aren't afraid to ask for help. And as with most things, unfortunately, it takes something like the heroin overdoses and the opiate overdoses and the fentanyl overdoses to hit the right communities, if you will, for someone to do something about it. Um, you know, we're very reactive once it affects mainstream America. Heroin's overdose deaths have been going on for a long time in different neighborhoods, but when it started becoming more mainstream and hitting if you will, white middle class America, now it's an issue. So it's, it's good that the communities are getting involved and that's, you know, that's a benefit from it. And um, like I said, the DEA realizes that you can't just, you could have thrown me in jail and go, okay, you're arrested. That had no bearing or even the thought of getting in trouble with the law had no bearing on me wanting to use. It wasn't, it, it wasn't a deterrent. And it's, it's not a deterrent to most people because it is an, it is an addiction, it is a disease. You know, I, I did things that I, I couldn't even, oops, sorry, didn't mean to hit the button yet, fathom and that never thought about. That's why I know that this, this disease of addiction really just hijacks your thought process, especially when you start at such a young age. You know, for example, I remember when I was back in the day at an ATM, you could only go to your bank's ATM. You couldn't go to other bank's ATM machines. They didn't charge you anything. And I remember like depositing an empty envelope in the ATM machine and hitting uh, $600. Because at the time they let you take out half of what your deposit was. So I was like, okay, cool, $600, $300. I get $150 out, go, go get my drugs. And never gave thought to the ramifications of doing that. And the sad part is, is my dad was a manager and vice president of the bank. So it was, you don't think 
your brain is not capable of, of thinking, boy, this isn't smart. I remember driving down into Cleveland area and uh, when I was in the middle of my crack use, I would just drive down a street and people would come out and they'd offer you rocks. Hey, you want a 20, you want a 10? And I remember driving down one of the streets and rolled down my window, it was probably 10, 11 o'clock at night. And uh, the guy says, you a cop? And I'm like, no, I'm not a cop. And he just pulls out a gun, sticks it to my head and says, good, give me all your money. And I said, well, all I got is 20. Gave him the 20 and I did what any good crackhead would do. I just drove down to the next street, found someone else and got my drugs and went home. So you just don't think that, boy, there's something wrong here. I didn't think about that until my late 20s where it was like, okay, I don't know, maybe, if it, maybe it was a developmental thing within my brain, but once I started getting older, it was like, this is wrong. Something's not right here. I want to stop. But I couldn't stop. But at least the thought for the first time after like 20 some years of drug use, I finally thought, oh, I want to stop. And, and I think that was, you know, that was just the key is that, that you just want to stop. And I, I did that, and that's a whole nother story about overcoming my addiction and what I did and, and people that helped me. And, but for today, I just like, want to get into now just the uh, actual discussion about stressors and how we deal with them. And I mean, these are stressors that all of us feel at one time or another, and, and there's, there's many more up there, that are the, or that are up there, rather. But I highlighted the unforeseen events because I think things you don't know are going to happen are the ones that are going to affect you the most and put the most stress on you. I mean, you can plan for things. You can be a little stressed out with finances, finals, schoolwork, whatever. But when your car dies, now you have to get a repair, you have health issues. It's all these unforeseen events that really can add to your stress. You know, this time of year, you know, there's a lot of stress with people with holidays and shopping. And, you know, when the weather changes, you have a lot of that seasonal affective disorder. And, you know, so there's just different stress and how you deal with it is... Um, Different, uh, different ways other than using drugs or alcohol. Um, my wife actually got me to finally believe that first one because uh, I would just like, something would happen and I would just be so angry about it and it would be like, say someone cut you off. And it's like, oh, he cut me off. But I'd be like an hour later still focusing on it and just being upset about it. And, my wife happens to be a clinical psychologist, but she did tell me, she goes, you know, you're giving the person that created the action all the power. I can't control that that person cut me off, but I can't control how I react to it. And I think that's one of the things in life is that we don't have control over most things, but we do have control of how we react to it. I mean, there have been things that would upset me so much and my wife would just be like very calm and I'm like, well, doesn't this piss you off? And she'd be like, well, it upset me, but it happened. Now I just move on. So, you know, and the, the second one as far as growth happening outside of your comfort zone, accept it. Things are going to happen that make you uncomfortable. That's where you grow. You do think, you, you could do things. You might want to take a chance on something, but be afraid to try. You know, it may be fear of failure. You may not have support from anybody that wants to help you. You know, they're like, ah, you know, you can't do that. What are you crazy? You know, at your age, you want to go, you know, go back to school or do something different. Or in my case, you quit your full-time job. You know, where you're making good money and and great benefits to do what? Try to make money, start your own business, and help people. And and that's. Luckily, with my wife having her job, it afforded me the ability to be able to do that, take that chance. I still feel uncomfortable about not having a full-time job because I had worked 14 years and, and did make great money. But I, I really am glad I did because I do like talking to people, 
and trying to encourage people to uh, pursue what they would like to pursue in life. And trying not to catastrophize, I'm guilty of that a little bit. Everybody sort of does that. You know, I've projected things that are going to happen in the future, you know, and that's why I have to stay in the present. We're not fortune tellers, you know. It's like, I know what's going to happen. So-and-so is going to come over, and then this is going to happen. They're going to get in a fight, and this is going to happen. And most of the time, it doesn't happen. You know, there's, there's no, you know, stay in the present as far as, like, I remember talking to someone going, like, today you look outside and go, oh, it's a beautiful day outside. It's nice. It's sunny. And this person looked at me and said, yeah, but it's supposed to rain on Saturday. And it's like, okay, but why are we worrying about Saturday? We don't even know if we're going to be here Saturday. I know it's not a great thought, but, you know, nobody knows. All this is what we have is the present. So, you know, one of the things that I try to do is to stay in the present. So how do we sort of, I have some strategies for stress reduction. Um, one is called mindfulness. Basically, that's what I was just sort of talking about, is living in the moment, decluttering your mind. I mean, I know I used to be this picture on the left. Just everything, all your thoughts, you know, I, and that are just going through your head and things that you, you don't really control. And you're just so focused on all these external things and you're not you're living in the moment. Now, the, the little thing that the dog's thinking on the right, uh, that's maybe a little far-fetched, but we gotta be somewhere in the middle. You have to, you know, you have to deal with things. I mean, because that is life. You, if you don't deal with things, then they just compound and you'll just even get more stressed out. So yeah, I just try to, try to stay in the moment and try to declutter the mind. Um, as I mentioned earlier, running. Uh, running's my big thing. Um, the cardio, I need the cardio desperately. I know how I feel when I don't run, and and actually, my wife will be like, I'll talk to my wife and I'll say something, and she'll just look at me and go, she'll go. So when's the last time you ran? Basically, that means get your butt out the door and go run because she doesn't like. She can see the attitude change, and I can feel it. I uh, was doing a race a few about a month ago, and I actually I'm still recovering. I cracked my ribs pretty good, and. Uh, I wasn't able to run for almost three weeks. And I can feel it when I can't run. And so I'm right now I'm trying to think of what I can do when I can't run because, you know, with the weather, I still run outside uh, all year round. I, like I said, it's sort of my new passion addiction that I started years ago. I run, last year I ran 17 races of marathon distance or longer and I train constantly and, and a lot of it's for physical reasons but I think the big benefit I get is for running is, is mentally and um, it's that runner's high not to be confused with this one yeah that's what we used to talk about that you know, that runner I get a little bit of a runner's high but yeah I just I just had to throw this in there I was doing this at uh like I said, a running club, I was giving a presentation and they just sort of got a kick out of it. Yoga, meditation, um, a lot of people that are involved in yoga do it for the physical and mental benefits. Um, it helps me stay grounded, stay focused, keeps me injury free um, for running by you know, increasing my flexibility, my core strength. Mostly I use yoga as a mental thing though to calm my mind down and just stay in the present it's uh it's something i don't get i don't go to a studio as much as i'd like to to practice it but i do get up every morning and take about 10 15 20 minutes just to do some stretching and some meditation and it sort of just um gives me an uh, you know they always say attitude of gratitude and that's hard, to, that's hard to have some mornings. You wake up, you're not in a good mood, something's not going right. And it's like, so I just sort of try to do my yoga, take a break, you know, and be thankful for all the things I do have. I mean, just everybody in this room is fortunate to be in this room for, for whatever reason. You know, there's people that can't, can't make it here, people that have a lot of health issues, other issues. But So the yoga and the meditation just helps me to sort of say centered and ground myself.
And this is very true. You know, there's a reason why they tell you when someone's upset to just breathe. If you're ever upset and you just start doing some deep breathing, some good cleansing breaths, it's hard to keep that, you can't keep that anger bottled up in you while you're breathing. And, you know, it's just, it literally is impossible. I mean, I know when I would get upset, I could just feel my jaw tense, feel my chest just fill up with air, and it's like, Arr! But once you can let that out, you know, so when people frustrate you, they upset you, things aren't going right, you know, just take a second. Just take a deep breath, take a few deep breaths, look back, do a little reflection, let your mind go somewhere else. One of the things I never was a big fan of, actually, until meeting my wife and talking to her more since she is a psychologist, was, was talking to someone else about it. And in today's society, with the stigma and with people that seem to know everything, even though they know nothing, because they know more than the experts, like that gentleman who said, oh, it's, it's just a choice, it's not a disease. Yeah, because you know what? I thought of nothing better that I'd rather do on a Saturday night than root around on the car carpet on the ground looking to see if I could find pieces of crap cocaine to smoke. <laughs> you know, so, you know, but talking to someone, and when I say someone qualified, it, it could be, oh, a psychologist, a social worker, um, school guidance counselor, it could be someone from a clergy, you know, you just want to make sure whoever you're talking to is qualified to give you advice because there are so many people that are giving advice out there that are more opinions than they are sound advice. And, um, and one of the things, one of the reasons I also say about someone qualified is because, I, as I mentioned earlier, about the dual diagnosis between mental health disorders and substance abuse is that you may start off by talking to say a psychologist, and having issues, mental health issues, and then he realizes that you also have substance abuse issues. Well, if he's not qualified or she's not qualified with substance use or substance abuse, then you should seek someone else, seek someone who is to add to that. I um, see a therapist about every three months, just a little talk therapy session to keep me grounded. Um, Actually, the only time I went on medication for, because I did have a dual diagnosis of depression, you know, and then my substance abuse. And I actually was put on medication when I quit smoking cigarettes uh, and antidepressant because that was, you know, cigarettes was something I did for 34 years and it was like giving up my best friend. And that's how I coped with a lot of things after I gave up drugs and alcohols. I still smoke like a fiend. And that was one of my coping strategies was to just smoke a lot of cigarettes. Well, I got put on Wellbutrin and then I was put on a, another a mood stabilizer by a psychiatrist that I had saw who really didn't talk to me much. And it's sort of after about six months to a year with the psychiatrist, I realized that I go in there, I'm there for 10 minutes, she gives me a prescription and I'm gone. And it's so ironic now that I'm, I'm involved with getting groups that are dealing with the overprescribing of opiates and painkillers and medicine because I realized that she never really was talking to me. That's what my psychologist did, but she would ask a couple questions and then give me my prescription. In um, 2013, um, with talking to my wife, and reading and, and finding out more information about it. I knew that by practicing some of these coping skills, because it wasn't a severe mental illness that I had, I mean, obviously there are mental illnesses that do need medicated and that's understandable, but mine wasn't that severe. I was able to stay off, I've been off any medication for the last what, three and a half years now. And that was through a lot of these techniques and just things that I do, but it's work, and I think that gets lost sometime in, in today's society is that some things you gotta work a little bit at. It's not gonna be easy. I know we have instant gratification, and you know, you see the news, I mean, you see the TV commercials, there's a pill for literally everything, and it's gonna help you 
do this in five minutes and you're going to look like that guy with the six-pack abs who's never had an ounce of fat in two minutes. But if you pause it for a second and you read the fine print, it says, when in conjunction with a diet plan and results not typical. So if you want, I really think that people have it in them to deal with things a little more on their own if they're just willing to, you know, I've been uncomfortable at times. I've, I've not wanted to do things. Uh, when I'm training for a 100-mile run, I usually start training about three months out specifically for that race, and I have a training plan. It's not, okay, I have to go run for four hours today if it's not too cold, not too windy, not raining, and it's nice and I feel like it. It's like, I have to go do that for my training. If I want to be successful, if you want to be successful, you have to put the time in. Um, it was something someone said, you, you race like you train, when it, in, like when it comes to running. If you, if you train half-assed, you're going to race half-assed. So the hardest part is when you absolutely don't want to go out and do something. I don't feel like running. I don't feel like going to the gym. I don't want to go to yoga. Because, you know, there's a lot of times that things at 7 o'clock in the morning before the days hit you sound pretty good to do. At 5 o'clock at night, it's like, I don't want to do it. So I found that when you least want to do something is when it's most important that you do it. And it seems to have the most benefit. So, and I found that through my running. You know, on days when I really just don't want to go do it, I don't want to get up, it's dark out, blah, 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 it's rainy, it's cold, you know. I come back and I feel refreshed. So, you know, there's just different things you can do as far as, you know, you talk to people, you know, you just talk to people. If you find like-minded individuals, you know, you there's enough negativity out there. I call them the gloomers and doomers because there's people that are going to tell you what you can't do. Oh, you shouldn't do. You can't do this. Why do you want to do that? I, I had someone tell me that all that running you do, it's not good for your knees. You're going to have problems. You're going to have this. I mean, and, and I don't want He was a 340-pound diabetic telling me that my running wasn't good for me. So I don't, you know, you don't need it. If you, you, if, if you don't have someone to talk to, there are options out there. Are you guys familiar with 211 at all, Lake County? I was not familiar with them until I was actually working on uh, the crisis hotline here in Lake County. I did that for about seven months a few years back. And um, it's called, every county in the state has this. And it's called 211. 211 gives you all kinds of information. Um, as you look here, all the human services needs that they have, I mean, they have stuff for extreme, you know, you have food banks, shelter, clothing. You just call 211. Um, there's a number, if, um, if you're curious about it, I can give it to you later, or you can jot it down. Uh, the 211 doesn't necessarily work from a cell phone. Because, you know, some people's cell phones, people move from other states, they just keep their cell phone number. So they have a number there that you could dial, the 440-639-4420. But they will point you in the right direction, who to talk to, who you can see. I mean, the services that they provide or will hook you up with, you know, they have counseling, they have drug and alcohol treatment, intervention and rehab, um, they'll point you in the right direction if you're having issues with um, an older adult. I mean, and these are all things that are offered everywhere that can help you relieve stress because you can talk to someone, you can get some information. It's, you know, you're not out there on your own. And it's hard, I know, that some of the hardest things for people to do is to, is to ask for help. But in this day and age, there's so much out there that's available. You know, I mean, from financial aid, they've, they've, they will help you with shelter, food, nutrition. You name it, they'll do it. And um, I've talked to some people when I was on the 
hotline, talked to them, at, and they have been really were amazed at how much they got helped or pointed in the right direction. Because part of the, some of the hardest thing to do now is just to navigate the system of who to talk to. So if you're not sure and want to talk to somebody, you can call up the 211, and at least they'll get you hopefully to a person who can connect you with the right person. And then they, you know, they're, they're another thing they have to do is if you want to volunteer. I, I volunteered at the food bank a couple years ago down in Cleveland. I do volunteer work um, with my running um, and business. And it, it makes you feel good. It's, you know, it's, it's really nice to be able to give back and, and help people. So, you know, if you're looking to help people, you know, there you go. So this isn't only the key to overcoming addiction. This is, this is the key to a lot of things in life. It's, it's a key to, to making some positive changes. And the more people you can find that have that belief or, or don't dissuade you, from trying to reach a goal or what you believe, the better off you'll be. Like I said, there's enough negative people. I was, I was always amazed at how easy it was for a person to bring people down and how much harder it is for a person to bring people up until I started hanging with different people. It was like, wow, there are people out there that are, that are positive people and, and that, you know, maybe they don't agree with everything you're going to say, or maybe they, you know, maybe they think your dream's crazy or what you're trying to, but they're not going to tell you no. You know, people that will support you. You know, and that's the whole thing is just, if you get out there and do different things, deal with your stressors, help other people deal with their stressors, you just, you don't know whose lives you're touching, you know, and, and how much help that you're providing to people. I've been living in Northeast Ohio for 55 years. And actually the reason I live in Menor now, I moved from Lyndhurst to Menor was when I decided to straighten out my life, I gave up all my old friends. And I think that's what makes it easier as an older individual, as someone at that time older, now I guess 30 is probably the new 15, but I was able to just leave all my friends behind and just move on because I was almost 30. And I, I, I see that as, as a big issue with the younger kids. You know, it's, it's got to be really hard for younger people to sometimes admit that they need to just move on from other people. And I'm not saying that, like, I don't know people that still drink a little bit or maybe smoke a little weed or something, but it's not their big thing. I started off with pot, you know, smoking weed and then, you know, but. As I got older through high school, I just, so in here, oh, you want to pill some speed, whatever. I just never thought about it. It wasn't, you know. Now, the only thing I will say is I've been told since I've become a peer recovery supporter for, that we try to avoid dirty and clean. Okay. Only because it's that negative, there's so much stigma. I don't, I. What is the word that? Yeah, recovery. I mean, and it's funny because it was like, I've been in recovery for 20, I feel recovered. Some people, you know, so there's all these little factions of, well, you can't say this, you can't say that. It doesn't matter. I'm not using today. I haven't used in, in years. But yeah, so I, I started off crack. I remember uh, cocaine was my big thing. And then I remember someone, they introduced me to crack and I smoked a hit of crack. I'm like, oh, what a joke. And literally for the next six months, I lived and died to just get crack. And I mean, and, and I didn't, I wanted to focus more, uh, you know, towards the end on stressors and how to deal with them and stuff like that. I didn't go over half the things that happened to me along the way. Luckily, very little involvement um, with the law, but I did buy a telephone pole, fire hydrant, a couple cars. I, I firmly believe that Physical activity, yoga, meditation, all the things I, I talked about. I try to use that as people who are trying to transition from a, um, from a place of use to non-use. Or their family members, you know, like family members, um, people that are using, that are trying to stay straight, if you will, trying to stay sober. 
I promote and believe in physical activity, yoga, meditation. I didn't really touch on proper nutrition and sleep patterns. I mean, that's very important too, but so I do that through speaking engagements. I do that through phone consultations. If someone has one-on-one -on -one that they just want to talk about, you know, there's a lot of people out there. It's not just for, for the people that are actually, or individuals who actually have substance use issues, but it could be a family member. Because some of the people I see suffering the most, and usually is, are the family members that feel so helpless. I'm not gonna take someone who's just quit all their substance use and go, okay, now go run. You know, it's, it's a process, but if they wanna use it as they transition through their sobriety or non-usage days, you know, to, as an alternative to teach them a little coping skills, go. So you can't run, go for a walk. When you can run, we'll run. You know, just get out, do some exercise. The, the cardio aspect of running is just tremendous, especially when it comes to, in effect, I'll, I'll actually talk to them down the road about doing maybe another talk that deals with some of the benefits of cardio and exercise as far as when it, dealing with um, substance use issues. So, you know, it's just, a, it's just the idea of like, it comes from within. I also want people to be the most, you should be the most involved in your recovery. I mean, I know a lot of times with, especially with heroin and opiates, you need a, people need to get into a treatment center, they need help that way. But you still have to be ready to accept that help and want to change. And one of the things I, as, as, as I get more, more involved with this is that I see a big lacking of aftercare. And, I, and, and I'm thinking that maybe what I do will be part of an aftercare program. I've, I've been talking to some people and from different, you know, whether it's someone who works in drug court and talking to them about getting people to, you know, maybe do some exercise as part of there, do some running, set up a group. I've been uh, talking to the, director over at St. Malachy down in uh, Ohio City. And uh, we had a nice meeting and I'm, I'm gonna see if I can get a group of their recent alumni and people that are still at their facility to uh, run. And, I'm vol and I, I gave her a proposal where I'm just gonna volunteer as a way of giving back my time once a week to get a group to run and, and just go do something. It's, it's amazing when you see people do things that they never thought were possible or they were told was never possible. And, and like I said, it's part of the whole aftercare thing because you know, I was very fortunate by living in the suburbs. I, I lived away from where I went to get all my drugs and stuff like that. Now, someone goes into a program, a treatment center, yeah, they're gonna teach you coping skills and, and they can help you out, but if you're sent right back into the same situation you know, I didn't, have a, I didn't have family members that used. I was the worst abuser of all the friends that I knew. But so if you're, if you're in a situation where you're, you're trying to change and then you're just, boom, okay, you're done, your treatment time's up. Now you're back in the same environment with the same people. That's putting a lot of pressure on people. It's, it's almost, I mean, I think some of the, and it depends on how they tout their effectiveness, but even the best treatment centers, I, I wanna say their, their effectiveness is, is in the single digit percentage wise, as far, and the, some of them only base it on one year clean, and some of it based it on different criteria, and, and, and obviously different treatment centers are gonna base it on what makes their facilities seem a little better than others, but the bottom line is it's still up to the individual you know, so I try, I think one of the things I'm going to focus on uh, with what I'm doing is having a physical fitness component as part. And I think, you know, as you see more and more articles about cardio, physical fitness, mindfulness, nutrition, you'll see that they're, they're really seeing that that becomes more and more important as a component just to an overall wellness program. You know, because the health has changed so much and the definition of what a healthy person is today. 
So that's, yeah, that's one of the things that I'm going to be focusing on. Nudging is good. Okay. You ha I mean, I, don't, I won't say you have to, but you can nudge, but you have to also accept the fact that old saying, you can lead a horse to water but can't make him drink. Right. Sometimes you can't lead the horse to water even. Well, one, they didn't at first because I think it was a generational thing where the, my parents' generation, they didn't talk about things. It was kept hush-hush. I didn't even know that my grandfathers were both alcoholics till after I was clean. You know, so, it, and my parents were able to help me out when I went through a telephone pole and ended up upside down in my car on St. Clair Avenue. You know, they were able to help pay the fines and stuff like that. From an emotional standpoint, though, they weren't involved emotionally. My mom, first of all, was just naive about stuff like that. And my dad was streets, street wise, but he was sort of like, you'll learn, <laughs> you know. And, but, but they were always there if I, if I sought help. But yeah, you know, it's like you can push, you can you can push a little bit, try to urge, in a in a in a. As long as it's done from, I would say, a stand a compassionate way or a caring, loving way, then that's one thing. If you, if you're pushing someone or saying, you need to get help, you know what you're doing to me and your father, or you know blah blah blah, it's not going to work, right. you know. But but I do believe that everybody's ready when they're ready. And I don't really like the, you'll be ready when you hit bottom, because everybody's bottom's a little bit different. Now maybe my bottom was different because of the environment I grew up in, you know, if, or many factors, or, or you know, the way I was brought up or raised. That, I'm sure that affected, you know, the beliefs that I had growing up. I'm sure that affected where my bottom was, but it wasn't running through a telephone pole and ending upside down and almost killing myself. That didn't stop me. Actually, that was happened right before I started getting into crack. But, you know, so you can encourage, you can talk to, but I think the big thing is an open dialogue. Just being able to talk. I still have family members that we deal with that have issues. But you talk, you encourage, it's very frustrating, I know, with, with what's going on with the opiates and that trying to get people into treatment. And, and hopefully I'll learn more as I keep doing these summits with the Adams Board and other uh, local politicians and doctors and nurses and first, of, you know, to find out, first responders, to see what can be done. Because the problem is when someone, especially when you're, you know, and, and heroin is, is way out of my expertise. In fact, I don't know why I didn't, I guess it wasn't around as much, but I just didn't do heroin. And I wasn't, I wasn't interested. Maybe I was afraid of needles. I never did like needles, but I know you don't need a needle to do heroin. But so I know that it's, it's with heroin, fentanyl, other opiates, it's very addicting and a lot of people need treatment and they need to get in a treatment, if nothing else, to detox in the proper way. But the problem is, is that if you're ready then and you can't get in somewhere, the odds that you're going to be able to get in or stay or still want to, f want to be admitted two, three weeks, a month from where they finally have a bed open are slim. So it, it's, a, it's a really desperate situation for a lot of people that I hope they come up with. Away. I mean, the sad fact is, is that it's almost easier to get into a treatment center if you have no money and have Medicaid than if you have health care. I mean, it's, I, 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 I know someone that actually is, is filing through Medicaid now because the health plan is like, no, you can't get in. Well, and, you know, when, when a treatment center says, well, we'll come and send someone and pick you up and take them to, well, it's going to cost you a lot of money, and that's and that's that's you know it's the it's the sad truth. And as I get more and more involved with people that are dealing with heroin issues, whether it's their son, their daughter, loved one, them, or themselves personally, it's I see a lot of anger at a lot of these meetings, especially when people have lost someone, and um, understandably, 
but there is no easy answer. You know, and that's why when I tell people with what I'm trying to do is not say that, oh, you should just be able to stop what you're doing and, you know, pick up some shoes and go run. And it's, that doesn't work that way. I, this is more as an after care program, which I still think is a big thing too, because there's, I think if I'm not, and maybe you would know, I believe that the average opiate addicted person takes about five times before they actually Get, is it 12? My son had heard it's 12. I so, I mean, fifth, sixth, it's yeah, I've dealt, I'm dealing with someone now who's probably on his fourth or fifth try. And it's, and it's just sad. And, that, you know, and, and you get those attitudes from people that, and it's just like, oh, they just don't want to stop. I mean, honestly, just say no was probably one of the worst campaigns ever started because it doesn't work. If I could just say no, I would have. The Knowledge Exchange is a presentation of Lakeland Community College.